Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Ghosts and Spirits video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's continue with Chapter 4, Part 3 from the great book, The World's Greatest Ghosts by Roger Bohr. This one once again continuing with the theme associated of ghosts of the deep. In other words, ghosts that are found in several bodies of water. Very interesting stuff. We've seen some good examples. And now it looks like with one of the segments at least, it's going to be about something that I've talked about in the past. In, the, in terms of one of my past videos. I always love when that happens because it's a great way to showcase that story again here and then see if there's any new information. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's start this part three. And then I'd love to hear what your own thoughts and opinions are as well. And I'll give my own a little bit afterward too. So here's what it states. The first segment is the ghost ship Orang Madan. Anybody remember that one? That was a video that I did a good number of years back. So here's what it says. A dozen ships picked up on the SOS, which read, Captain and all officers dead, entire crew dead or dying, and later, now I am also near death. Then the airwaves went dead. It was a perfect day in February 1948, and of all the vessels that heard the strange message, only one was able to identify the ship in trouble and pinpoint her position. The ship was named as the Dutch freighter Orang Madan, bound for Jakarta, Indonesia, through the Malacca Strait. Within three hours, the first rescue vessel was alongside the Orang Madan. A crewman said later, sharks were surging around the hull, and it looked like every shark in the Bay of Bengal had horned in on her, knowing there was death aboard. When there was no response to flag or radio signals, a boat was launched and the rescue party climbed aboard. They found all of the ship's officers massed in the chart room as if their skipper had called them to a council of war against some unknown disaster. All of them had died there. They seemed to have died within seconds of each other. Their eyes stared in horror and their bodies were already locked in rigor mortis, some with their arms pointed to the heavens. The dead seamen littering the decks had died in the same way. A doctor who boarded with the party later reported that uh, there was no signs of poisoning, asphyxiation, or disease, but all seemed to have known that death was coming, even the ship's dog. They found it below decks with paws in the air, fangs barred in a silent snarl. In the radio shack, the telegrapher had fallen over his silent key. The rescue ship tried to take the Dutch ship into tow over to the nearest port, but when tackle had been readied and a tow line rigged, there was a gush of oily smoke from one of the holds. Knowing they could not contain the blaze without flushing pumps and steam, for the fire, the salvage crew fled to their own ship. They had only time enough to cut the tow line before the stricken freighter exploded. The blast scattered wreckage for a quarter of the mile and even killed some of the hungry sharks. What was left of the Rangmadon actually sank. In the short inquiry that followed, the doctor reported that something unknown had killed the men. Although the official verdict was death by misadventure, the mystery of the ghost ship Rangmadon has never been solved. Next segment is called The Mystery of the Mary Celeste. The most famous ghost ship of all time is the Mary Celeste. More than a century after her bizarre discovery, drifting and devoid of life in the middle of the Atlantic, no one is any nearer to solving the mystery. Mary Celeste, the square-rigged brigantine, pointed her bows out of New York's East River on November 4, 1872, bound for Genoa in Italy with a cargo of crude alcohol. Aboard her were 37-year-old uh, American master Benjamin Spooner Briggs, her first mate Albert Richardson, and a crew of seven. Also tucked safely below decks were the captain's wife Sarah and their two-year-old daughter Sophia. On November 24th, Briggs recorded in his log that he had sighted the Azores. The weather was stormy and some of the sails were furled. The following morning, the ship's bearings were noted in the log. It was the last entry ever made. Ten days later, the British brigantine, the Del Gracia, sighted the Mary Celeste drifting aimlessly. Captain David Morehouse ordered a longboat to be launched to investigate. The three crewmen who rowed across to the mysterious ship found not a single man, woman, or child aboard, living or dead. In the captain's cabin was Mrs. Briggs's 
rosewood melodyne with a sheet of music still on it as if someone had left in a hurry halfway through a piece. The sewing machine was on a table. Little Sophia's toys were neatly stowed. In the crew's quarters, washing hung on a line. Clothing lay on bunks, dry and undisturbed. In the galley, preparations seemed to have been made for a breakfast, although only half of it appeared to have been served. Captain Morehouse, mindful of the salvage value of the vessel, took the Mary Celeste in tow. As they headed for Gibraltar, he had time to ponder on his mysterious discovery. As he put forward theories for the riddle of the Mary Celeste, so he found arguments for dismissing them. Morehouse first thought that the ship must have been abandoned in a storm. But why then was there an open and unspilled bottle of cough medicine along with unbroken plates and ornaments in the captain's cabin? A mutiny, perhaps? There was no sign of a struggle, and why should the mutineers abandon ship along with their victims? Perhaps the ship had been taking water. There was three feet of water in the hold, but this would be the normal intake over ten days for any old timber hold ship. Nine of the casks of alcohol were found to be dry, but a further cask had been breached. Could the crew have gone on a drunken rampage? Yet below decks the ship had been in perfect order. In fact, there was no sign of panic or alarm. One of the last acts of Bra Captain Briggs had been to cut the top neatly off his boiled egg before leaving it uneaten on his plate. The most baffling question of all was this. How was the Mary Celeste able to remain on course without a crew for 10 days and 300 miles? When the Gracia caught up with the mystery ship, Captain Morehouse was sailing on a port tack. The Mary Celeste was on a starboard tack. It was inconceivable that the mystery ship could have traveled the course she did with her sail set that way. Someone must have been aboard her for several days after her last log entry. Captain Morehouse toured the Mary Celeste into Gibraltar Harbor on December 13th. After an inconclusive public inquiry, he and his men were awarded the salvage money they had sought. The ship was refitted and sold, but she remained ill-fated. Sailors refused to sail on her, believing the vessel to be cursed. She changed hands 17 times before finally running aground and then sinking on a coral reef off Haiti in 1884. And then the last segment is the Devil's Triangle, at least the one for this part. Tormented souls may hold Bermuda key. A startling theory to explain the mysterious disappearance of ships and planes in the notorious Bermuda Triangle is that the strange happenings in that region are caused by tormented souls from the spirit world. The claim is made by two leading exorcists who believe that the spirits in the area known as the Di Triangle of Death the Devil's Triangle and the Hoodoo Sea are from 10 million people who were dumped or thrown overboard during the slave trade period. Their troubled souls can take over the minds of pilots and sailors, just as people on land are said to be possessed by spirits. In a unique experiment, special prayers were held in the Muir Triangle to lay at peace those tormented souls who supposedly haunt the Atlantic graveyard of 140 ships and planes and more than a thousand people who over the years have disappeared without trace. Backing this extraordinary theory is British surgeon and psychiatrist Dr. Kenneth McCall. He said, we call it the possession syndrome in patients who are mentally disturbed. It may be multiple or single or in a family or haunted place. The spirits just got to express themselves so they possess us and control our minds. Just as in our world here, one or two people can cause torment or haunting disturbances. This can happen with the crew of a ship or plane, and on a very large scale in the Bermuda Triangle. It seems the spirits are trying to draw attention to their state. They are not concerned with destroying the other people. There is no such thing as time and space to the spirits. They are wandering and lost and possess people to draw attention to their own plight, just as a lost child will do to an adult. These unhappy lost spirits are in purgatory. Because they did not die naturally and were not committed to God, they are causing disturbance. Dr. McCall, at the age of 67, wrote a special service to be said over the troubled waters, and this included the Requiem Mass and the Anglican Eucharist of Remembrance. He said, I think this will lessen the number of planes and ships that disappear there. Dr. McCall carried out 600 cases of exorcism or laying on of hands in the United States, 
Canada, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland. He was a member of a Church of England commission on exorcism in Britain. He made many visits to America and with 12 American professors wrote a book on the subject. It was after working as a missionary in China where he was imprisoned that he found he could cure the prisoners through the power of prayer. He said, when I returned to Britain in 1946 and learned all about psychiatry, I realized that the same results occurred in mental hospitals. The patients were disturbed because they were possessed by a spirit. His theory that millions of disturbed spirits are in the Bermuda Triangle, the area bounded roughly by Bermuda in the north to Miami and then beyond Puerto Rico, came to him when he was becalmed on a small banana boat in the Sargosa Sea. He said, I had been on a lecture tour in the States and visiting relatives. The ship's boiler burst and we were drifting. It was calm and peaceful and I heard singing. I thought it was the crew, but I couldn't think why they were singing all of the time. Dr. McCall checked and found that none of the crew was singing and there was not even a record player aboard. Then I realized it was someone else, like a moaning chant. It went on and on, solidly for five days and nights before we got moving again. My wife, Frances, also heard it. What we heard fitted all of my theories. He believes that during the slave trade years, about 10 million slaves went overboard. They used to push them over because they got more money from insurance the way, that way. Those who were pregnant or diseased were thrown to the sharks. Others preferred to jump over the side rather than die in slavery. Of the many mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle, the most famous is that of the missing warplanes. It is also the case that first aroused widespread public curiosity and gave the area its name. On December 5, 1945, a flight of five Grumman United States Navy bombers took off from Fort Lauderdale, Florida for a training flight in perfect weather. Shortly afterwards, the pilots radioed that they were on course, although they were actually flying in the opposite direction. Two hours after takeoff, all contact with the aircraft was lost. A Martin bomber was immediately sent to search for the missing planes. Within 20 minutes, radio contact with it had also been lost. No trace of any of the aircraft was ever found. In all, six planes and 27 men simply vanished into thin air. In Dr. McCall's view, the leader of the training flight believed to the be to believe to the last that he was heading in the right direction, but that his judgment was distorted by spirits. The spirit theory had been current among seamen for many years before the world heard of the triangle. The greatest disaster in the area had taken place 27 years earlier in March 1918. That was the month in which the U.S. supply vessel Cyclops vanished from the face of the earth without making a single distress call. No wreckage or any of the crew of 309 were ever found. The service and prayers aimed at ending such disasters were carried out in the Bermuda Triangle by exorcist Donald Omond, a 74-year-old retired Church of England vicar and expert on the occult who described himself as a spiritual surgeon. In previous exorcisms, he had driven spirits from people, buildings, and animals. Dr. McCall was unable to go with him to the Triangle, but Omond was accompanied by an English doctor and writer, Mark Alexander, who said, The Reverend Omond often works with medical men and psychiatrists. Nearly all of his cases are referred to him by doctors. This is a sensational subject, and my eyes were opened by a lot of the things that he did. Omen's work of laying spirits at rest had been supported by Peter Mumford, the Bishop of Hartford, who said he was a member of a church commission which reported a few years ago on exorcism. He is a recognized exorcist and an expert in the field. He is very experienced and well-regarded and has contributed to our understanding of this field. But whether he has placated the spirits of the Bermuda Triangle, only time will reveal. And then there's a little mini segment that's called The Ghost of Grace Darling. Two lighthouse keepers told television viewers in 1976 that they had both seen the ghost of Grace Darling on separate occasions. The men worked at the Longstone Lighthouse on the Fame Islands off the Northumberland coast. 
Grace was born there in 1815 and became a national hero 23 years later when she and her father rode out to rescue nine survivors from the storm-wrecked steamer Fort Farshire. Grace died of consumption four years later. The men said they had seen her ghost in the lighthouse engine room walking around in clogs. And then that's it. That's it for this go-around, part three of chapter four from the book World's Greatest Ghost by Roger Bohr. Once again, having to do with Ghosts of the Deep. So let's go ahead and let's talk about that here. For starters, Orang Madan. How about that, right? One of my oldest videos. I think that was one of the earliest ones that I did on the Ghosts and Spirits side for a while there. It was actually the top rated, top viewed, in other words, video of my entire channel. Several hundred thousand views. I have to check again what the latest tally is, but that's the last that I saw a couple of years ago. Very popular video because it's a great subject. What happened on that ship, right? What were those men seeing whenever they all died seconds of each other? Their eyes, as the book was describing, stared in horror, some of them already in rigor mortis, pointing at something. What was it? What exactly caused them to have that. And of course, the most frustrating thing is any evidence of all of this was gone because there was that explosion that basically caused Orang Manan to sink and there was going to be nothing, nothing else showcasing more information or evidence, nothing that could, other, other than theories going forward, that could point to this is what happened. It's a strange case, very bizarre case. Um, I still wonder myself like exactly what happened to them. Not even the dog made it, which is so, so sad on that. So next one is the Mary Celeste, which I've also talked about as well. This one had to do with that interesting case associated with, again, people missing, everyone gone. And, and in this case, there was nothing there that made it seem like it was sudden. It was just like it suddenly they were living at one moment and then they were gone, like they disappeared. And probably the most telltale sign for me was that simple little egg that the captain was cooking, carefully slicing it open. You can tell that he was experiencing nothing traumatic right before whatever happened, happened. And yet they were all gone. Everyone was gone. And then, of course, the ship happened to sail perfectly in the opposite. I'm sorry, in a direction that normally would have been opposite of its of its of its trajectory, but there it was meeting the other ship as well. And then finally the Devil's Triangle. I've talked about that too. How about that on my channel, right? Here you have a situation where a location is infamous. This is the first time though that I've heard that theory involving spirits, particularly the spirits of slaves. What a way to go though. Imagine that. There they are basically captured put into slavery, transported over and across the sea. And then in order to make sure uh, that people can collect of all things on insurance, in order to make sure that that happens and they're out there in the middle of the sea with nothing but the sea surrounding them as far as they can see for as long as possible, then they were getting thrown overboard just to make more money. So if, that, if you have that theory with that guy stating about 10 million slaves going overboard, you can totally see why this location would be haunted galore. Like it would be a location that would have who knows how many hauntings to this day, all of them vengeful ghosts. And so them causing so much calamity afterward for other ships and then also apparently for other uh, for their airplanes as well. One could realize that that could be an interesting theory. The fact that they were also trying to do exorcisms out there, that was new to me too. I don't I don't remember talking about that on the channel or on my actual video. But then that's pretty much it. Let me know what you guys think about these latest parts. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care. Bye.